Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Professor Sisa Pichana. I'm a principal scientist at the National Laser Center. My research team, in my research team, we have um, Dr. Trotling, who will be taking over from me, um, who are sharing the presentation. So at some stage, I'll pass over to him. Um, also, we have uh, Dr. Masina, Mr. Nana Arthur, Pingas Baloi, Rubilani Ramufile, and Samuel Skosani. Um, we are fortunate in a sense that we have a large network of research collaborators, um, amongst which we have University of Johannesburg, VETS, TUT, and Botswana Institute, International University of Science and Technology. Um, my topic this afternoon, rather our topic this afternoon, is on laser processing of high temperature materials for jet engines. In particular, um, we're, we're dissecting our contribution as a CSIM in this um, fast developing research field. The outline of our presentation is as follows. Additive manufacturing, I will start off by giving you some definitions of what we mean by additive manufacturing. Laser processing of high temperature materials, which is what we're all about. Um, before that, we'll give you the reasons why we're doing um, what we're doing. Um, we'll showcase some of the results that we've obtained in the past few years since we've been in this field, amongst which we'll talk about heat treatment, uh, microstructures, mechanical properties, in particular, performance of the materials. Um, we'll give you an overview, or at least a flavor of what is happening globally in the area. Um, our future endeavors um, and some conclusions. What is additive manufacturing? Um, we know that additive manufacturing has been around since around about the 80s. It is also known as advanced manufacturing or 3D printing. Um, the American Society of Testing and Metals, ASTM, defines additive manufacturing as the process of joining materials to make objects from 3D CAD data, usually layer upon layer as opposed to subtractive um, processes. Uh, this can be used for both um, metallic and polymer products. Um, at the bottom of the, that um, slide graph there, we have how the process starts. Step one, um, you conceptualize what you want to make for your uh, product. Um, you take that whatever um, component you want to make, you make um, a CAD file, computer edit design, you fit it um, into um, software, you slice it. The net result of that sliced uh, thing gets put into um, the machine which is programmed to do um, the additive manufacturing. Basically, for lasers in particular, there are two distinct processes that um, we use. We have the so-called direct laser forming and we have laser metal deposition. Um, they are distinct in the sense that with direct laser forming, um, the part you have a process chamber, um, which is filled with argon gas, as you can see in the view graph there. Um, the laser is programmed according to the path of the um, part that you want. Um, a layer of powder is placed on the bed. That is why you call it powder bed sometimes. Um, then the laser is um, allowed to melt a path um, on the powder bed. Once that is done, it's solidified. The bed is dropped down a little by a known amount. A next layer of powder is put, and the laser again, um, according to the product that you want, um, melts the second powder. Um, the process repeats itself, hence we call layer by layer, until the whole part is formed. Um, whereas laser metal deposition in the the laser and the powder are programmed to meet at a certain location. Um, the laser and the powder are traversed at the same speed. As they move around, they leave a solidified layer. The process is repeated again until the product is completed. Now you note that um, with the laser, um, direct laser forming, the part comes from below, whereas on the LMD, the part comes from above. Um, in the table there, I illustrate some of the pros and cons of the two processes. Um, they've got the, the um, 
what you call um, fit for purpose. Um, one is good for this, one is good for that. Um, but um, LMD in particular, we can use it to repair components. Um, uh, selective laser melting is a very, very flexible process. Um, complex parts can be made. The disadvantage with um, LMD is that you cannot make um, roofs or parts that have heads, whereas you can with um, direct laser um, forming. Um, there are a number of companies that make these type of machines. There are companies that are just specializing in laser or powder bed systems, amongst which we have um, um, Akam, we've got selective laser melting. Um, what I mean is that we have um, companies like EOS, SLM Solutions, and many others that are specialized in um, powder bed systems. We also have um, powder blown system among, the, the very famous one amongst them is Optomec, um, which we have um, one of their machines at the CSIR. Um, also uh, these days people use um, wires and hybrid processes to make parts. Again, you can see the view graph where the process starts from CAD up to the end product. What I would like to let you know is that um, since um, around about 28, 20, 2018, you can see there that um, there is an explosion uh, globally, um, which takes about, uh, it's sitting currently uh, around about 26.4%. These are metal uh, 3D printing. The forecast is uh, in the region of around about um, 700 million. Um, by 2020, don't know if it will happen because of COVID. Um, we think that um, the involvement of the Asian region, particularly Japan, China, India, will actually help um, the uptake of additive manufacturing. Just we have to say that um, the, it's not um, widely practiced because there are certain things that must be addressed for it to be fully accepted by industry. Um, as soon as those other problems are sorted, we hope that um, there will be more engagement. Coming back home um, in South Africa, um, since about South Africa has been around, has been involved in IT manufacturing since around about um, the 80s, and in particular, we actually in the continent, um, South Africa is one of the of the leading ones. Um, there was. Um, this, the former DST, now DSI, put in a lot of money to try and stimulate additive manufacturing research in the country. And this led to um, the CSR and Aerosmith, amongst others, developing the first homegrown, largest powder bed system in the world. The two parties involved had each um, something to contribute, so sharing the intellectual property um, the system is it's up and running. I'm um, sitting at um, NLC building 46. Uh, in addition to that, um, not to say that uh, CSR is um, what you call the dominant player uh, in additive manufacturing. The view graph that I put up there shows a, a large network um, of universities that participate in additive manufacturing. There are just too many for me to. Um, list all of them by name, um, but you can see that um, there is quite a number of activities happening. At this stage, um, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Tlotling, who is going to delve into more details about what we, as the CSR, are doing, um, in particular, our contribution to high temperature materials processing. Well, thanks, Prof, for that massive introduction. Um, the results that I'll be showing in this presentation today is part of the uh, processes that we've been doing since I completed my PhD, maybe from 2017 under Prof's uh, responsibilities and administrative role. We've been able to conventionally move out of the traditions of how manufacturing can be done using lasers. What we're going to present to you is one material uh, for high temperatures. We, we normally work on inconels, but recently from 2016 until now, we've been embarked on understanding titanium aluminides due to their uh, qualities, especially in processing for the jet engines. They are light in structure, therefore, if we can successfully manufacture parts out of them, then we could aid in structural reduction in applications. So 
what are these things and why are they so important to us at the NLC? Um, like I have said, they, they, they can aid in, 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 in high temperature applications. But the problem with them is with conventional systems, these materials are crack sensitive so that they, so they can no longer be made with casting and other processes. They require a lot of post-processing for them to be accepted in the industries. So in 2016, Prof conceptualized this idea of using a laser beam to alloy these metals from elemental powders and see if we cannot come up with an alloy that is performing equally so against the already being preformed alloys from big uh, institutions. So what we have been interested in was a systematic study where we are showing how a beam can be used to melt metals and studying those metals in their alloy form post-processing and understanding how are we conventionally positioning ourselves in this industry of high temperature alloys, in particular focusing on titanium alumina? Our interest in the end is to try and make um, gas turbine blades because of their industrial applications and they're widely needed for other intended applications, whether be it in energy, in aerostructures and things like that. So they're more interesting uh, for those applications, but they're expensive to make with current uh, technologies. So we thought if we can use a laser beam, can we not reduce process costs and uptake by markets? So that is an ongoing work. We are still focusing. So our systematic work involved use, uh, studying the binary phase diagram of these alloys. We went into ternaries, quaternaries, and so forth. And the results we'll be showing you are very outstanding in a sense that they are in published literatures and we have contributed significantly since 2016. What is globally available is this alloys here. All these alloys are per company, per part that people are intending to, 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 to solve a particular problem in, a, in an application. So we tried to mimic some of these alloys, uh, producing them using a laser beam. And to date, we've been successful. But one thing that could be taken as a, as a whole message is, is this statement by Novayachi et al. from Russia, who says, in the powder metallurgy convention way of making alloys, especially of this high temperature alloys, there is no more need to be doing these alloys because they understand how they can be made. The only challenge has always now been on their processing and that challenge still continues. So from our viewpoint from the CSIR, what we are doing now is we are not only solving the problem with the technology, we are also making an alloy in flight as we go. So we are, to, we are killing two beds with one stone here. And that's why our process has a beneficial added benefit if successfully so we can do this. The question is, can we at the CSIR do what we have promised to do since 2016? So traditionally how those alloys are formed, you take a metal, you put it to temperature, you form several intermetallics, you do heat treatment, depending on the phase that you want, then there comes out a, a structure that you want, then you will use that structure for whatever intended application. This is traditionally how things have been done, okay? So what we at the CSIR, since the acquiring of this lens system, we have used a laser beam to make these alloys while studying the characteristics of the alloy and their intended application. So basically what we do, we take powder in its elemental form, design a CAD file like Prophecies I was showing you, slice this file in the lens, make a big or little block, then we study it for characteristic purposes. And in our case, the first time we started this research, we were focusing mainly on microstructures before we go to performance. Because with a microstructure, we, are, we can be able to know what type of a performance our alloy that we generated uh, can give us. So that has been ongoing. And we have published uh, most of this work in several journals. This is the latest journal that we, we published on metals. If you are interested in, in looking at the work, you can go and read there. But basically the summary here is that in laser uh, alloying, you can do what we call functionally graded material. So you can make st uh, smart structures without having to stop adding powder, stop adding powder. You can do this in flight. That is, is captured in the summary of our, of our article. So you can go and read there. But what is interesting is our alloy is already showing good performance if you compare it to the globally produced uh, alloys. So this was very interesting, and this is just in the binary phase. But we know 
that in the binary phase, this alloy is always going to crack. That is why in the previous alloy list that I showed you, there are several metal components that they add to promote ductility and perform high temperature performance. So we studied this cracking behavior and we also published a paper on it. But what was significantly and very interesting about us was our alloys are not as cracking as the ones that are done in casting because in laser you can control how you lose or gain energy in the end. Those things are dependent on that uh, thermodynamic processing. So we have a publication on that and we tried to study a ternary from a, 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 a binary where we were adding niobium. Niobium is considered a ductile promoting um, a metal in these types of, of, of high temperature alloys and it's also necessary for high performance in, temper in high temperature conditions. So we have a paper in that where people can just go read. The take home message here is that our alloy was underperforming um, and we, we discovered that it was underperforming and it was cracking because we did not get the required ductility due to whatever form. We were losing temperature, a lot of temperature during processing. So the, that was the challenge. How do we then went and mitigated the, the problem was we, we started studying processing on a heated bed. So what you are seeing here is the same thing now produced on a heated bed. What heat, heated bed is helping us with is the um, the mixing of this element in a melter pool. So you can see from this view graph that uh, we've got a elemental mixing that is almost perfect without heat treatment. So that was beneficial. We continued to make parts out of this alloy of ours. Um, and we are now showing from uh, the previous uh, diagram that we can make uh, crack free parts in our laser lab. And, and that is very comforting. It means we have achieved one of the responsibilities of making this crack free alloys using a laser beam. And that is an advantage for us. So we've studied performance using tensile properties of these alloys. Um, so what you will see in the next diagram is the paper, we, the book chapter we published uh, earlier this year. Uh, just now, this book is, is on high temperature application of titanium alloys and we have contributed massively there. What you can see from our results, uh, I don't know if that is, is very view, uh, visible. What we have shown is that Processing and heat and processing is very critical because these things, they depend on melting. But post-heat treatment was also critical in the structural formation, but also for performance. So we have summarized those results there. But what we are showing here is that our alloys are performing much better than the commercially casted uh, parts, which is very interesting to see. So we also did high temperature tensile pooling. And you can see that these alloys that we are making, they perform very, very nice in the region 600 to 900 degree temperature. That summary there is very interesting because now we know which type of applications this alloys can be used for. And that's what we intend to do. So in the end, we looked at what the global view has been. Archem with GE, what they have done is they have produced a laser in 2018 that is specifically focused on making this titanium aluminum crack free. So they had to retrofit some of their 27, 20, 2007 and 2009 uh, EBM machines to be able to achieve this. To, in order for one to be able to process this uh, high temperature crack sensitive material, one has to be able to have a control in temperature. So they retrofitted this machine and now they are able to publish, uh, to print commercially some of this uh, gas, micro gas turbines. And we, we also are interested in making this micro turbines that's in our lab. So what you will see there is our future endeavors where we are going to remake the lens to be what we want it to be so that it can be able to perform in a, or able to make the parts that we want from this titanium aluminides and other high temperature based uh, alloys. So the difference from us and the ICAM machine would be, uh, we can use both pre-alloyed powders and um, laser in situ melted powders to make parts while they can only use pre-alloyed powders. So added advantage to us if our machine can do exactly what we want. At this stage, we are just now trying to connect bits and pieces of uh, equipment. Probably, if it was not for COVID, we will be far gone uh, with, with this machine and we'll probably be demonstrating a, a, a live part of this alloy that we would have printed from our machine. And for that, we are very grateful that we, we have contributed on this body of knowledge. And thank you. Uh, we can take questions.